Cheers, guys. Epics 911. Welcome to the Elitist Geek VR News for Saturday, November 5th, 2016. Let's jump right into VR, guys, and talk about Sony. Now, the article comes to us from Upload VR. It's uh, an article by Jamie Feltham, one of my favorite writers at Upload VR, and it's titled Please, Sony, no more VR tour modes. And I got to agree with him 100%. You guys know I was pretty pissed off uh, the other day with the announcement that Gran Turismo Sport was not going to have the type and duration of VR that we were led to believe it would. VR that we were led to believe it would a year ago, Nine months ago, six months ago, three months ago, one month ago, two weeks ago. It's literally two minutes to midnight when we find out that, you know what? No, it's only going to be a subset. And the reason why, which is pure BS, as I and many of you pointed out, or at least we strongly suspect it is, uh, you just, you don't do that. And... They're not alone. Other companies have done that, but some have gone about it, you know, a little bit better, like Call of Duty, for example, right? Uh, the danger with theirs is that it doesn't really represent the gameplay, you know, that they offer. But from a safe VR point of view for them, it gives them experience. It allows them to monitor statistics, how many people are playing VR. They're going to be able to data mine a lot from that. And that's the approach that Gran Turismo Sport should have taken. Had they come out and said, look, guys, we're, we really want to embrace VR. We're just not so sure about it. Uh, we don't have the in-house expertise, but we want to get there. What we propose is this. We're going to include this blah, blah, blah in VR. It's only going to be this long, but it will allow us to, you know, moving forward, get a lot of knowledge out of this and improve and deliver a future VR game. Had they said something to that effect a year ago, there'd be no issue in my books. And I think for most of you, there wouldn't have been an issue. But literally to wait two minutes to midnight, yeah, not cool, guys. And Jamie sums it up pretty nice. Uh, you know, you guys pointed this one out to me, and, and I agree, or many of you did, that... It should be up to the players to determine what's comfortable or not comfortable, right? Within reason. They could have accommodated that other ways. Personally, my gut instinct tells me it was a performance issue. They were not able to get the performance that they were looking for. They couldn't turn back. They were at a point of no return. They went with lame excuse number one. Just speculation. I could be way off but it's the most plausible in my opinion. I like his closing statement, Jamie. He goes, much like with new console generations, it's going to be the new experiences that offer something we haven't seen before. Those are the ones we'll truly remember. The sooner we realize this, the better, because I would rather play a new original IP that works natively in virtual reality than another shoehorned experience that leaves me wanting more. Bingo. Nothing more to say, really. Next news piece. Michael Abrash uh, and his five-year predictions. Now, we talked about this, guys, and uh, at the time, I talked about it twice, actually, we didn't have a lot of the specifics. Unless you had sat in on that Connect 3, uh, the reporters that were around at the time didn't really get into this kind of micro detail. You know, nor was it, you could argue, maybe their job to do that, right? Case in point, we've got some added details and it puts things back kind of into perspective with why Michael chose the time frame that he did for his predictions. So let's start with the visual aspect. So, you know, at the time, there's the stuff we know. Rift Vive, 110 degree field of view, got it. 1080 by 1200, got it. This one is where it gets interesting. That all represents 15 to 20 pixels per degree. Real human vision, which you can't really measure in the same way, you know, but for sake of simplicity, let's just go with, yeah, you know what? Humans 
220 degree field of view. There's all kinds of other factors, but like I said, let's just say that. That would represent 120 pixels per degree, assuming 2020 vision. So we're going from basically 10% of the way to human vision to 33%, or from one tenth to a third. So we're making definitely good strides, right? Uh, technology wise. Michael said back then that in those five years, we're going to get to the point of 140 degree field of view, 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, right? But going back to that other stat, what that represents, and it's a bit more meaningful way to measure it, is that we will be at the 30 to 40 pixel per degree framework. Like that's kind of the, the way to measure it. So like I said, that goes from a tenth to basically a third, and that is significant improvement. The only one that I have an issue with is the audio prediction. And, and here's why, for me personally. I've seen audio on the PC go from absolute poop, trust me, um, I have. And just super quick anecdotal story behind that. My buddy Exidy, who you guys see on Fridays on the videos, him and I sold our Commodore Amiga 500's beloved machines. I'll say that up front, but we sold it down the river because of gaming, even back then. It was all about the games. So we sold our Commodore 500, Amiga 500s to get the PC. We did it at the same time to benefit from volume discount. We didn't have enough for audio. So for the first, I want to say three months, we had to use PC audio for classics like Wolfenstein 3D, or was it out at that time yet? think it was whatever the game was wing commander for sure was and let me tell you unless you've tried pc speaker oh my god talk about water torture it was bad when we finally got our sound blasters it was just such a relief to not have to listen to the beeps anymore but it was still inferior to what we had on the commodore until about the mid mid to late 90s, I would say, that's, that's when things started turning around on the PC side. However, even though you had giants like Creative Labs, by the time we got into the early 2000s, their R&D just really stagnated. They weren't as popular card-wise anymore. Uh, and, and here's a perfect example. Most people, when they're buying a game machine now, the part you hear often talked about the least is audio. Because most people's assumption is, you know what, the 7.1 on my integrated motherboard is good enough. And really, for the most part, it is. But as a result of that, the numbers, the revenue for, you know, companies like Creative Lab just isn't there. Likewise, the R&D didn't really continue at that same pace as it did in the early 90s. So... End result, yeah, the audio has not kept up with the graphical side of gaming. And that's going to be the biggest gap to make up, in my opinion, for Abrash's predictions. His controller one, though, yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I think controllers are going to get better, but the type of controller, like the Touch or that new Vive prototype, will probably be close to the norm for a lot of years to come i.e. that'll be the VR version of like the mouse, right? And lastly, I just loved his workplace concept because I'm one of those guys who, you know, like I said before, whoever invented the five-day work week, yeah, I would just love to talk to that asshat. Because <laughs> in this day and age with the technology we have, it should not be necessary with one life to live to have to spend that much time working for somebody. But hey, some people enjoy work that much. Me, I'd rather spend time on my hobbies, but I get it, I get why, I just don't agree with it. So please get to the point where some of us can do a lot of that stuff from home. It would be great. Next news piece, the Future Group raises 20 million to blend real world video with virtual worlds. Uh, Future Group, they're an Oslo, Norway based company pretty much emerged from like a stealth mode a year ago. Check this article out, it's really interesting, talks about that um, and kind of the idea behind their technology. So they've got a lot of unnamed partners 
and they've got a technology that they're basically calling IMR, another acronym for Interactive Mixed Reality, right? They hope to use this for stuff like game shows and their big thing, which is funny because it's exactly what I described a few months ago and I'm not trying to take credit for that. I'm just saying, and there's probably a lot more that thought of that, that it is such a nice logical next step for the evolution of VR. Uh, put simply, why does it have to be augmented or VR? Why can't it kind of be a blend of both? And for me, ideally for stuff like boardroom meetings, meeting with customers for business apps, right? The thing that would work best is having the real life you in the virtual environment. So when you have boardroom meetings, the boardroom meeting could be anywhere. You guys could be meeting, you know, the Parthenon in Athens, whatever, right? Um, but the real magic is ensuring that the you that's represented is you, right? All kinds of reasons for that. Body language to convey tone, intent, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so very cool that they're working on exactly that, blending real life you into virtual environments. Next news piece, Valve have gone with this uh, new licensing model for the commercial side of things called the new Steam VR licensing model. Essentially what it's there for, because right now the end user license agreement we signed, they're not commercial, they're for home use. Yet arcades have opened up using that same end user license agreement in a commercial capacity. Now, HTC Vive has pretty much played nice up until this point when really they didn't have to. Uh, so it's nice to see that rather being, than being antagonistic towards people, they're accommodating them with this licensing model, which really doesn't add any extra cost under that scenario. Now, they're still responsible for purchasing the games, but this allows that end user license agreement, for example, to work in a cafe. So I could walk into the cafe, use my login, play my games, and simply pay the proprietor, right, the store owner, the cafe owner, for the time usage, right? Really like that aspect of it. And like I said, a, a not an antagonistic way to go about it. So props to them for doing that. Next up, Microsoft HoloLens may soon be used by tank commanders. I thought this was cool. There was a uh, arms and security conference in Kiev uh, back in mid-October. Apparently some military personnel, Ukrainian military, saw that, loved it, uh, working with a company uh, called Limpid Armor. So they've devised a hybrid HoloLens tank helmet. And what this essentially does is gives the tank commander a 360 degree view of the exterior of their tank. So talk about really improving visibility. That would be amazing. Not just the visible spectrum, but infrared as, as well, which would be awesome. And uh, they call it the circular review system. So another acronym, but hey, IT acronyms abound, right? CRS, so circular review system. And really, why stop there? I can see this being used in all kinds of other applications. Drivers, choppers, you know, people flying, just all kinds of potential. Next news piece, best VR ready laptops. Now this one is a rather lengthy list. So I'm just gonna put the link here. Uh, at first glance, it looks like it's only MSI and that's just because they have such a leg up on the competition because VR has been an initiative for them early on and the numbers show with the models they have out there. Everything from 980s, and the majority of them are 980s, to those awesome mobility 1060s, 1070s are represented. Origin, Asus, Alienware, uh, and some others. And of course, MSI, who I just talked about, all represented here. And uh, cost-wise, not so bad. Goes from about $1,400, I think was the low, to $3,000 plus. But... Not a bad way to go about it if you want a mobile VR solution. Although this next news piece, I like even better. And this is from a company called Zotac. And I've purchased their products before. Uh, my 660, TI-660s were uh, Zotac units and fantastic. That was one of my favorite SLI setups. That had a lot of life in it, that one did. And They've come out with a new VR Go Mini PC. You've got to check this out. 
rather than the full laptop thing, they've added the straps to the bottom of this mini PC. So it has backpack straps, but they can be removable and it's not a full on backpack. Fantastic SSD drive, which really should be mandatory for mobile VR anyways. Uh, removable battery, which is key. One of the things we worried about and wondered about. So yeah, no power cords. How long the battery is, they didn't say. My guess would be like a laptop battery, possibly a bit beefier, but giving you about two hours of gameplay. And it'd be cool if you could add, uh, you know, a, a beefier style, uh, like you can with the 3DS, like mine, 15 hours of gameplay. So, but anyways, check that out. It's an i7 processor and a 1070 GTX, which is awesome. That is the Zotac VR Go PC. All right, guys, that's it for news on this Saturday. As always, cheers, and definitely catch you on the VR flip side.